Ariane, I want to start with a question for you. So, so as you said, David laid out a fairly precise alternative uh, path to FinTech for good. Multi-product financial firms that build reputations and loyal customers by serving as a fiduciary, automating advice and accepting thin margins. So what, what was your reaction to that proposal? Um, a, a, an, an academic's pipe dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also being, I think, starting to being done now. Not, not targeting, you know, the, the low end yet, but if you look at, you know, like, where all these monoline companies are going, that's where they're going. I just saw, I, I listened to NPR this morning on my way in, personal capital advertising a high yield savings account, so they're broadening. Robinhood, Wealthfront, you name it, they're all going, right, like kind of multidisciplinary and, and combining deposits and assets, and so I think that's exactly your vision. Um, so I think it's actually happening, um, and that'll move down market to some extent. Um, you know, it's also, you know, I think it looks great on paper and it's really complicated to do. You're dealing with the regulatory environment which doesn't really support that kind of thing. Um, so, I, th I think the thing that I would double click on that is that, that could be exploited more is your basic economic framework, right? Like your basic economic framework and apply my kind of fascination with infrastructure, right? It doesn't need to be so upside down, right? The $100 per year cost that a bank has on its core processing system versus the $20, you know, like yield on interchange and whatnot, um, you know, actually doesn't need to be that way at all. Right, like you can, that $100 cost can, that's, that's two oligarchs running on cold bulb, you know, mainframes. That can be more like, you know, a dollar or, you know, like very, very little, which really changes everything, right? Like if you can do that. Um, and I think that's completely within view. I mean, look at the chimes of the world, right? Like chime, and I, I agree with your point, by the way, that, you know, a, a deposit product has an implicit credit relationship right, to be profitable. But the chimes of the world and their predecessors, the green dots and the net pens of the world, you know, I think their kind of technical innovation was to, to build on top of the core processing system and build a sub-accounting system which is dramatically cheaper. So you have one Fiserv account and a million, you know, sub-accounts and I'm managing them basically for free. The Marquettas of the world, right, I think are kind of allowing that. Um, and I think that's, that's transformative. It's, and, and David, you, you had mentioned that um, you know this firm that you would like to see exist or that could exist doesn't really exist. Why do you think that's true? Well, I, I think it's Ariane, right? That's mm -hmm. how, that's the pronunciation. You got it. Uh, so um, I think Ariane's right. On, on, on two in two ways. It's extremely complicated to bring all these product lines together. It's not the way the regulators see the world. And if you're trying to build something up from the ground, you start with mono lines, and then you start expanding. And we're seeing that happening. Um, I do think there's an opportunity for whoever gets to the larger scale first, because there's a lot of externalities, uh, sort of network externalities, by having all these accounts in one place, and then, then one gets stickiness. But, um, but you got to get there, probably, given the constraints that capital markets present, one product and one regulator at a time, and that's costly, that's slow. Um, so I think that's a barrier, though we're overcoming it. Another barrier is that the quickest road to profitability is not this road. So if you want to go out and make money in financial services, it's going to be high fees, it's going to be opaque, it's going to be shrouded. Um, it's going to be credit. It's not going to be wealth formation if we're, if we're talking about families with low income. Uh, so, so anyone who's knowledgeable about this space and wants to jump in and make money quickly doesn't want to go down the last bullet on this slide. They want to go and turn around. I was talking to uh, a venture capitalist uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was saying, well, let's talk about the NPV of this business model over a 20-year horizon. 
And he said to me, we never go out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's all we need. Someone laughed. <laughs> Uh, and he said, yeah, we go out seven years. And anything past seven is essentially a zero when we do our calculation. So, so if you're thinking about a seven-year horizon, you're never going to get here. Um, this requires building up reputation, dealing with dozens of regulators, creating something that, that will take serious, long-run investments. And um, maybe we don't have an appetite for that societally or culturally. But I think, as you point out, more and more organizations are getting their piecemeal. Yeah. So I think we are going to get there, maybe not in one, in one big jump. Yeah. Well, I love that. And if, and if someone comes to you who wants to do your thing, call me, because I want to <laughs> bet on that thing. Uh, like, and I'm glad you mentioned Vanguard, actually. So I don't think people give Vanguard enough credit for applying the deflationary pressure on the cost of money as they do, right? Like, but for Vanguard, the world would be like trillions of dollars by everyday households would be managed at a much higher cost. And you know, like, I, think, I think their impact on financial services is as great as, Van, as, as Amazon's on commerce, yeah. but no one really talks about them. And one thing I think is so interesting, and this kind of is against my own interest as a VC, is that they're basically a co-op, right? Like this is a shareholder-owned company, and I think that is not just culturally, but also structurally allows them to do what they do and yeah. charge what they do. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna figure out a way for a VC to invest in a co-op, uh, kind of a co-op that becomes like that. Um, I'm really interested in that. Yeah, that's the model here. I mean, yeah. essentially, it's a for-profit vanguard yeah. in the financial services industry broadly. Yeah. So the two, so it, one of the things I think we're hearing is that a natural path to getting here would be through a monoline entrant that then expands into, and cross-sells. Now, what are the other ways in which that might happen? For example, credit unions doing some, uh, credit unions expanding an existing large bank, changing their practices, things like that. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen from a credit union because there's a lot of capital that needs to be deployed to get here quickly. But a large bank could decide to go down this path. It would be a huge culture change, and it would be a huge risk. And I could see the board having endless heartburn and standing in the way. But I do think there's an opportunity here to be the first player to reach this kind of scale and realize all of these um, connections and let's call them network externalities. I mean, if you have all these different markets simultaneously present and you've got a customer in this ecosystem and they feel great about the organization, they're a very sticky customer. So I do think that this is a model that, that is a profit-making machine even though it's so alien to the way all of our large banks operate today. Is it? I mean, Wells Fargo. What, what button doesn't Wells Fargo? I mean, I really, it's, well, e it's easy and we should. Is that a joke? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not. Uh, I mean, so. <laughs> well, Wells Fargo's had a lot of trouble yes. um, with the idea of um, doing things in the best interest of families. Yeah. Um, now, their current rhetoric, it, maybe I misunderstood the question. Uh. <laughs> I agree with Wells Fargo's pains, and I think Susan brought up the point in terms of like, let's be careful what we study, right? And let's, and let's align the things that we, I think Wells Fargo has all kinds of problems there. So they're a terrible example from that point of view, but that kind of makes it interesting to me because, you know, like part of, of this kind of diversification and having lots of, you know, products per customer could incent someone to, to you know, like make fake accounts like they did, um, but you know Wells Fargo and and many banks for that matter, um, you know, are multi-product, consider themselves a fiduciary. Okay, okay. So, so now I understand. I, I misunderstood. Wells Fargo should do this. This is this is like the way for Wells Fargo to get themselves out of their hole, rebrand for real, not with the you know rhetoric instead of the meaningful true value transformation. Um, but if Wells Fargo said, hey, we're done with the old model of banking, we're going to do this, and we mean it, and we're going to make that concrete, I think they would, they, they could 
meaningfully take the lead in this regard. Now, you know, we have Simple in the room, uh, a new entrant. Uh, they could be the ones to do it. Uh, they're not taking on all these product lines. They're part, um, of, an, they're part of an even bigger bank. So, um, so, you know, Wells Fargo, I think, is a, is a fascinating example of why the traditional industry has gone a different path, which is that it was historically far more profitable to take the exploitation path than the fiduciary path. But, um, but Wells Fargo is now in enormous trouble for that, and it's a rebrand like this that could, um, that could launch us into this place very quickly. Um, I don't know, do you think Wells Fargo has a, has a possibility, has a, a plausible path in that way, or is no. it? Too big of a culture shift and too big of an economic shift. I, I would guess that it actually probably would come from a credit union, more likely. And, and Where are they going to get the capital? Yeah, a, big, a bigger credit union, right? There are some very big ones. That's true. Um, right, like uh, BECU or Navy Federal or... Um, Right, like they're, they're really have separated from the pack in terms of being able to be innovative, get a velocity of capital. But yeah, you know, what's interesting about, the, about those is that in a way there are limitations on their growth and in a way that is good. Right? Like it, it prevents them from fee seeking, it prevents them from, you know, like from being compelled to do some of the other things around the edges that you're warning us of. Um, that, are kind of interesting guardrails, right? Kind of that come part of being the way they were organized. Um, I want to ask about um, a monoline product, which is the short, uh, lower cost, short term uh, credit. And so there are various models that are out there. There's the paycheck advance model, there's the opportune model, there are other things. What within that space is your favorite pro consumer model? that could still be financially sustainable? Hmm. That's for both of you. Well, you know, like the, the, the latest, you know, big thing is kind of the, is, is, are these overdraft alternatives. Earn in, Dave, Bridget, um, who in, in various ways, right, are basically overdraft avoidances by the same argument that you make, which is like, well, it's, you know, it's less predatory than the next guy. Who is less predatory than the next guy? Who is less predatory than the next guy? Um, you read my mind. <laughs> I totally, so I can't claim any of them as my favorite, honestly. Um, but you know, I could be accused of being envious because I'm not in them and they're all killing it. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, yeah, I, I think that's an interesting phenomenon. Um, I'm hoping that someone at Wells Fargo will wake up or B of A or wherever and just say, like, okay, uh, you know, uh, Dodd Frank didn't do it, but like this, like, let's just change something here. We can do this in a, in a more customer friendly, cleverer way. Um, that I think will be what I'm excited that that'll be the answer. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think there's, there's lots of innovators who are taking costs out of the credit business and mostly I'm happy about all that. Opportune is an example of that. Um, but they're still offering high cost loans. And yes, they're much less expensive than the loans they're replacing, but we're still focusing on the model in which liquidity is obtained through a credit channel that any financial advisor would say is fundamentally an unhealthy long run way of organizing your financial life, living from crisis to crisis on credit. Now, that's a very interesting conversation about why people end up being in that place instead of doing the kind of more rational thing, which is taking the next couple years to pay down their debts and then building up a tiny buffer of wealth that becomes their new credit line. And, you know, my my naive academic heart wants people to go down that better path. My realistic behavioral economics hat tells me we may never get there because there's something intrinsic to human psychology that makes us have a very hard time 
sacrificing today to build up that buffer so we can live better for the next 60 years. Great. Uh, I'm going to open it up in one minute for questions. In fact, I'm going to open it up now for questions. We have a question in the back. It wasn't meant to be depressing. <laughs> I, I thought it was quite helpful. It was. Um, so, but especially because uh, it's noted, I think, some of the, the problems there. So, so uh, uh, one of my things that made it depressing for me was some of the problems that you described there, as you briefly noted, could apply to many other industries, whether it's junk food or I can think of maybe most other industries. So I have a kind of a question, a challenge both for you and, and Arjan, um, which is, um, what, what, if anything, is special about consumer finance or 21st century consumer finance or maybe 21st century capitalism that has some of these uh, for-profit incentives misaligned with well-being for a lot of people? Um, and if it is a more general ch uh, issue, do you have some more general, you have a very specific plan here, but do you have some more general principles or thoughts about how we might address it more broadly in, in the economy? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great question, drawing out the generalities, and I completely agree that the problems that we see in FinTech are the same problems, financial services, let's say, are the same problems we see across any industry that is essentially a laissez-faire industry there's regulation here, but mostly it's firms interacting with consumers with relatively limited government um, oversight. Well, well, I just want to make it a little harder for you because it's already hard enough. But I'll make, and that is, it. I think at the same time, laissez-faire capitalism has arguably brought billions of people out of poverty. So is something new now, or is it is it is it always been this misaligned, or you know that, that I guess. How we might change the rules now that 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 made it makes it less successful now than it was for the past whatever decades. So just to be clear, I'm an economist. <laughs> I love markets. <laughs> markets are great, and um, I wouldn't want central planning to uh, shut them down. Um, I'm just drawing the distinction between the markets that operate the financial services industry and the food industry, which are to a rough approximation not heavily regulated, versus the markets that drive the education industry or the healthcare industry, which are very heavily regulated for very good reasons. Those are markets in which there's all sorts of wild externalities and adverse selection and um, elements information asymmetries that make a light touch regulation inappropriate. So of course we're going to have heavily regulated educational markets. Of course we're going to have heavily regulated, you know, we have public education as our primary mechanism for providing that service. Of course we're going to have heavily regulated healthcare. And, and I think those places have more opportunity because there's been less, centur fewer centuries of market-based actors seeking out every possible profit opportunity and getting us to a point where it's very hard to intervene and make things better. Um, I think this is another point that Josh made in his opening comments that in healthcare, in education, where there's much more, um, there's much less of this market-based organization and much more of a government intervened structure where there are more opportunities to creatively intervene, often with public-private hybrids. Um, so, you know, you mentioned uh, Health Sherpa. That's a domain where we have all of these government exchanges, we have private actors, uh, and it's all innovating relatively quickly. ACA is a new, a whole new um, framework, and, and I think in those settings there's different lessons to be taken away than the lessons we take from the markets that are more like laissez-faire, but the psychology that makes these markets 
difficult to improve upon, and the economics that makes these markets difficult to improve upon applies to other markets like the market for exercise or the market for nutrition, food, et cetera. And so I think you're exactly right to draw the analogy. I saw some other hands. Uh, oh, we have, a micro we have a microphone back there. Um, so a question for David and a question for Arjan. Do, do you think that uh, creating this, uh, this uh, good bank would be easier to do if it were a, a public benefit corporation? So companies like Kickstarter have reincorporated them as, the, as public benefit corporations to signal that their sole goal is not profit maximization um, and attracting the uh, capital that, that would go along with that. And the, my question for Arjan is that um, there are, are obviously VC firms that don't just wait for entrepreneurs to show up. Uh, they, they might use a venture studio to try to uh, uh, encourage the formation of a new business. Uh, so there are a number that do that model in, in the biotech area where they put together teams of uh, you know, seasoned biotech execs with uh, academics doing cutting edge research. Are there, are there VC firms that, that are pursuing that model in the fintech space that could recruit uh, Dave as the chief scientist and then you know, pair him up with, with a, uh, a, a serial entrepreneur? Yes. <laughs> and yes. <laughs> Next question. Yeah, so there are, uh, there's a bunch. Um, we do it very informally. You know, so many venture firms have many shapes and flavors of it. There's uh, another CFSI spin-off called the Financial Services Studio something something. Uh, Ryan Falvey, who does exactly this. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's, there's plenty that, that are, you know, there from the ground up to, you know, help and uh, kind of in the examples that you're talking about. So if you're looking for places, come and talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. So, so on the public benefit corporation, I don't know enough about the details of the corporate finance constraints and regulatory constraints to have any conviction on that. But I definitely think, and I think Arian touched on this point as well, it's not obvious that it must be a traditional for-profit corporation there are plenty of hybrid cases that are interesting and worth thinking about. My gut instinct, mostly as an economist, is that if you want to raise a lot of capital and you want to do something that's transformative for hundreds of millions or billions of people, you probably want to use the traditional corporate structure. But we should be open to alternatives. And Vanguard is a great example of one of those successful alternatives. Yeah, I totally echo that. I think the for benefit, we have a number of in our portfolio, and I think it's a great phenomenon, and I think it helps broaden general awareness. But uh, if, you, if you would think of that form of incorporation as a way to um, signal, like its signaling power will, I think, do more to limit its access to capital than expose it to more capital today. Um, we have, uh, in the interest of time, I want to take two more questions, and let's actually collect these two questions here. I have two quick questions. Andrea Levere, Prosperity Now. So, Ariane, one question for you. Your data on the community development field is probably right, but wouldn't you say the most profound impact has been how they've changed how the private sector views the risk of serving these markets, which then has made so much else possible? And David, my question for you is what regulatory change would be the greatest driver of creating the financial well-being bank you described? Hi, Andrea, nice to see you after way too long. Um, no, I disagree. I don't think, I think the, I think the economic development field has, my, my numbers are glib. They're probably right. They're back of the envelope and they're, and they're totally glib. Right, like, I think providing someone in the south side of Chicago who has access to nothing, you know, uh, you know, the ability to get a mortgage and then a duplex and then a sixplex and then a twelveplex, uh, you know, is a real wealth-creating path 
um, you know, on someone that the financial services wouldn't take a bet on, and in a thousand other corners of the world, in a way that like some app that we invest in that saves them 10 cents on something else, you know, doesn't move the dial at all. So I think the, I, I'd say the contribution is more, is very narrow in terms of people and very deep in terms of, you know, the impact on that person's propensity to be upwardly mobile. Not, I don't think it's, I don't think it's an, I couldn't think of an example in which it, at a scalable way, has helped the for-profit sector think about risk. Um, but maybe you're thinking of something I'm not, and maybe we actually agree, but that's my off the cuff. So I'm going to be very quick. Uh, in the UK, they have a more unified financial regulatory system than we have in the US. They have something called the Financial Conduct Authority. We have many, many different regulators. It would be probably better if we created a more unified regulatory framework. That is definitely an academic pipe dream. So more realistically speaking, um, more emphasis on embracing fiduciary standards wherever the regulation is done. That would move all of us a little bit in this direction. I love that one. I, we, have, we have a kind of unspoken investment thesis against principal agent conflict, which is basically to your fiduciary point said more eloquently as one would expect from you. Um, but I, I think that's a really good one. If I can answer that one too, just for fun, um, it would be ACH. Like I think if, if the regulators could move their hand, I just saw uh, Senator Warren came out with something to this effect to make real time ACH that would make a big difference on low-income people's lives. We're gonna take one more quick question. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa Coide, FinReg Lab. Banks are making 12 billion more overdraft annually. Uh, Arian and others, including myself, have heard banks say, we're not moving out of that business. We can't move out of it, we can't compete. This comes back to shareholders. How are we not thinking about who the banks are ultimately beholden to? And that that is an important place where we think about where we would end up getting something like this. My question is, one, do you agree with that? But two, uh, on a different topic, the fluidity of consumer data, how does that play into the competition and the opportunity or the challenge for a unified institution, depository, or otherwise, to be providing all of these products and services? Validity of consumer data. Consumer data, which is leading to competition, which is leading to monoline businesses. I know enough about you. I can offer you that small dollar credit option. You know, I can make enough in that space. Although, yes, of course, we do see some of them looking to build in the savings and uh, payment products. But how does that affect the ability to build out a unified institution that's going to offer all of these options. Yeah, that, that's part of the thesis. I mean, it has a lot of things going against it, that bottom bullet. One of the things it has going for it is all the ways these data streams are complementary. And now I'm a much more effective organization when I take modern data science methods and I unify what I know about you on 15 different markets into every product that I'm pricing and offering to you. So. One of the advantages of the good bank at the bottom is the integrated product offering. And regarding the overdraft fees, yeah, that's a huge problem. It's a, it's a way that banking services are expensive for financially distressed households and inexpensive for everyone who's not paying those overdraft fees. And that's part of what's toxic in the modern banking system and that's part of what you know, I'm trying to work to, to create alternatives to. Thank you very much to David and Ariane. Thank you.